Hello, my name is Jerry Split. I'm the program director for LifeLink. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your service and your role in safe helicopter landing zone operations. Takeoff and landings are two critical phases of flight. Our following video presentation will provide you with the tools for safe helicopter landing operations. Again, thank you for your time and service to the communities you serve and enjoy the presentation. Although the images and procedures in this video focus on Geisinger Life Flight, the same actions and procedures are applicable to any of the helicopter air ambulance programs operating in the state of Pennsylvania. First thing that needs to be done is selecting a landing zone officer. This individual is going to be responsible for not only communicating with the aircraft, but also uh, making sure that the landing zone that is selected is appropriate and uh, be utilized by the aircraft. Landing zone officer should give the aircraft a description of the landing zone. This is going to paint a picture for the crew of not only what they expect to see once they get there, but also how they're going to get into the landing zone. When selecting a landing zone, the area should be at least 100 feet by 100 feet wide. The slope of that zone should be considered and it should be approximately less than five degrees because the aircraft cannot land on something with a, uh, a greater degree of slope. Obstacles need to be considered such as high trees in the area, any type of lights, and particularly any type of wires, whether they be along a road or small wires that might be running to a light post. These are very difficult to see during the day and are nearly impossible to see at night. Other debris such as loose lumber, uh, tarps, even garbage cans should all be considered because the wind off the aircraft is approximately 80 miles per hour which can cause almost anything to come loose and blow away and either damage some, something on the ground or come back and hit the aircraft and cause the aircraft to go down. When setting up markings at a landing zone, it's preferred that cones or other type of LED lighting is utilized or flares can also be used. During night landing zone operations, the pilots wear night vision goggles, which assist us greatly in identifying any of the obstacles that might be in the landing zone. Night vision goggles is that they see white light very well and they also see red light very well, but they do not see any blue or green lights. And these actually don't even show up under the goggles. So when lighting a landing zone at night, white or red lights need to be utilized. Also, NVGs basically amplifying the light that already exists. So any additional lights such as floodlights from uh, emergency apparatus can overpower the night vision goggles. Flashing lights help us identify the landing zone at night and they should be left on when the aircraft is in the area. They can be turned back on when the crew has landed, but they should again be turned off prior to departure. This is pertinent for both hospitals as well as any type of unimproved landing zones. Once the aircraft is on site and has identified the landing zone, we are gonna do a large circle orbit prior to coming into land, and that's just our opportunity to verify what you told us over the radio. 
and also get a good look at how we're going to approach the landing zone. Generally, the helicopter likes to land into the wind and we would prefer an area that does not have a lot of high obstacles as the helicopter does not like to land straight down and straight up. Although we can, it's not the ideal method. If the crew gets to an area and we get a good look and we identify that either it's not big enough or the obstacles are gonna pose a hazard to us, we may ask that you move the landing zone. From the air, we usually have a very good viewpoint and we may uh, actually select a landing zone for you. If that's uh, a possibility, you will just have to verify the uh, surface conditions are suitable for us prior to landing. During dust and snow operations, pilots need to be cognizant of blowing conditions because they can lose sight of the ground in what's called a whiteout or a brownout. If they lose sight during hovering, the helicopter has a tendency to start drifting and can lead to a rollover or contacting obstacles. In order to prevent this, LZs should be chosen that do not have a lot of loose dust or if there is a light covering of snow, helicopters will often hover approximately 30 to 50 feet and attempt to blow out as much of the snow as possible prior to coming down. If possible, pick an LZ that has been plowed or blacktop is available and be sure that any snow drifts are below approximately three to four feet because the aircraft can tilt in directions that can put the tail rotor into any type of larger obstacle. talk to you today about special considerations in the landing zone environment. Special considerations are any uh, items that pose an additional threat to the aircraft when it's operating in the area. That could be drones, balloons, fireworks, birds, other aircraft. If they're observed, notify the aircraft to keep a lookout on those things. If the helicopter is running, someone needs to ensure the LZ is kept clear of all pedestrian and vehicular traffic. You want to keep the public back at least 200 feet and keep fire and rescue personnel back 100 feet. When we execute uh, landings on the highway, it's vitally important that fire police personnel and fire personnel ensure that there are no vehicles moving around within the LZ. The pilot generally will position the aircraft so that he can maintain a visual on most of the uh, activity going on within the landing zone. There have been plenty of documented cases where aircraft have landed on a highway and a vehicle has disregarded fire personnel impacting an aircraft. An additional thing to consider is at night, positioning of uh, fire equipment near any obstacles or things that may be a dangerous item to the aircraft or the incoming helicopter. Multiple aircraft LZs, you certainly want to inform all aircraft and agencies involved that there are multiple aircraft responding to the LZ. You'd like to position the LZ so that aircraft will not have to overfly another parked aircraft on approach or departure. Pick an LZ if you know that there's going to be multiple aircraft coming in. Pick one that's large enough to handle multiple aircraft. Ensure there's adequate space. Generally, we want at least 50 feet minimum between each aircraft's landing area. Another helpful thing is to position the LZ so that you never have to walk behind one helicopter to get to another one. If the space is available, generally the pilots will position the aircraft so that you can keep an eye on each other. Most importantly, don't approach the aircraft unless given a thumbs up by the pilot or being escorted by one of the crew. 
As a first responder responding to a possible aircraft down, it's important to obviously be able to shut down the engines if the pilot is incapacitated and the crew members are not able to do so. I'm going to go over two methods to shut the engines or the fuel off to the engines on an EC-145. The primary method is going to be the emergency fuel shutoff switches or buttons underneath the center glare shield. They are covered with a window looking pane on the bottom of the latch. It's safety wire. You can easily overcome that safety wire by just using your fairy and lifting the cover, pushing the button in, and letting it pop out. Two switches, fire number one, fire number two. Alternatively, we have two collectives most of the time. This collective has a twist grip. It's operated just like a motorcycle. So up is on, down is off. Thumbs up is on, thumbs down is off. If I'm holding it with my left hand. Of course, if you're reaching through the cockpit, you're gonna twist it away from yourself to turn it on. Both of these twist grips control a separate engine. The forward is the number one, the aft is the number two. In the event there's fire, there is magnesium in the transmission components of the aircraft. Foam is certainly uh, helpful, better than water. Assist the crew members if they're able to get out of the aircraft. The doors can be opened by looking for the orange dots and turning the handles. Also, by pulling the orange release that pulls the spring above the windows on the back doors, allowing the doors or windows to be jettisoned out of the aircraft for your access in and personnel access to be able to get out if they've not been able to do that. Today we're going to be talking about the litter system here in our aircrafts. There's a series of levers that all kind of do different things and work together to make it, make it all work. First lever is all the way up here. That's kind of the big macro adjuster, I call it. Hit that lever to make this slide back and forth. You have the micro adjuster lever in here. You can pull that to kind of just make little movements in and out as you need to. On the other side over here, we have one more adjustment lever. The lever go back and forth this way. If you need access at a certain angle to bring people in and out, or body habitus kind of requires you to use this sometimes. The last thing we have is the release to take the litter all the way out. This has two handles on here on the inside. You have to squeeze in towards each other, hold down, and then the litter system can actually come in. Now that we have our litter system out of the aircraft, let's talk about the straps. Here up top, you have two shoulder straps and sort of like a waist belt that'll go across the patient's chest. And the way that this works is this, is a, this has a twist action. You twist it and it opens up, releases all three of these, and then that folds out to the side. The other more simple belts that we have down here, just like a traditional seat belt, you know, our seat belt on an airplane, you lift, and that'll open up like that. Pull straps to tighten. So then putting this one back on, this would again go across the patient's chest. These two straps would come over the shoulders and they just buckle right in here like so. And that's the simple straps of the litter system.